Henry William Brands Jr. has written close to 40 books in the past 36 years. The Portland, Oregon native is a professor of history at the University of Texas, the same school where he earned his PhD in 1985. His first American history book in 1988 was titled Cold Warriors, Eisenhower's Generation and American Foreign Policy. The list of other books include one on Lyndon Johnson, Benjamin Harrison, Woodrow Wilson, Andrew Jackson, U.S. Grant, Abraham Lincoln, and FDR, and many others. We're going to talk with Dr. Bill Brands about these and his newest offering about Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, and John Adams in a book called Founding Partisans. Professor Bill Brands, in the introduction, I said you've done almost 40 books in the last 38 years or whatever. How do you do this? Well, uh, I write every day, and I think of these projects one paragraph at a time. So as I explained to my students, I teach. I've been teaching full-time during that time, and I explained to my students who are used to writing a short paper, a 500-word paper, but then they write a a long-term paper than a thesis, it's writing a book is no different than writing a term paper. It's just more paragraphs. And so I think of one paragraph at a time. Now I'll say this, that some people might think that teaching conflicts with my writing. In fact, I find that teaching reinforces my writing for the following reason. I make a point, I insist on teaching an introductory course of American history every year. In the autumn, I begin with the pre-colonial period and by the spring, I've gotten this up pretty close to the present. So I cover the whole ground of American history every year. And in doing so, I have to sort of keep the big themes of American history in mind. And I also have to learn how to explain and how to distill. I have one lecture to deal with the Civil War. And so I have to figure out what are the things that need explaining. When I decide to write a book, for example, about well, my book, Founding Partisans, when I'm writing about Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Adams, and those, I know 80% of the story before I start writing this book because I've been lecturing about it, because I've been thinking about it, because I'm making my students think about it. I really know what the sources are. I've been sort of through the, this period of American history, so I know where the sources are. The, the, the real question at that point is, who do I want to focus on? What points do I want to make? What moments do I want to highlight? So the fact that I am writing while I'm teaching actually works to my benefit. I don't think anybody can write 12 hours a day, at least not you know, over an extended period of time. So I manage to write every day, but at the same time, I know that, okay, I take three hours uh, to go teach, but that actually gets me thinking about, and my students are my first readers in essence, because I try out my ideas on them. If I can persuade them, my students are bright young people, but they're not expert in history. Most of them will not be history majors. They're intelligent, they are interestable. And so if I can make the story interesting to them, I have some hope that I can make it interesting to readers. The last thing is I like to write. There are a lot of authors for whom writing is maybe the least enjoyable part of what they do. A lot of historians like to spend time in archives and learn new stuff. And I don't know how many, how many of my fellow academics or just writers generally, they say, boy, that was a real painful experience that writing is like giving birth. <laughs> if, it were, if I thought writing were like giving birth, I certainly wouldn't have written the books I have. I enjoy doing it. When I have a moment, when I have 15 minutes to sit down and work on a paragraph thing, great. So I don't have to think in terms of, okay, I've got to write for four hours today. No, it's I get to write for two hours right now, so let's do it. Do you have groups working with you on these books? I, I engage in one experiment regarding the use of a research assistant. And that, that research assistant was my then 19-year-old uh, elder son who was home from college and without gainful employment. And he had been interested in history. He read history books and stuff. And, and so I thought, well, I'll, I will employ him and just give him something to do. So I sent him, I live in Austin. So I sent him off to the LBJ library in Austin. 
And I said, Hal, go off and you know, look at this stuff and see what you can find. And he went off and he he did it for about two weeks and he, he enjoyed it. It was great. Now, he didn't give me anything that I subsequently used, but what he got out of it was the experience of, hey, this historical research is kind of interesting. So Hal has gone on to become a historian, a very distinguished historian in his own right. So it was the experiment was very good for him. Uh, and it also reminded me that I don't use research assistance. One, because I don't know exactly what I'm looking for until I see it. And secondly, half the fun is for me to discover new stuff, to turn the page and read. I, I can still remember the moment that I turned the pages, I turned the page in one of the published collections of Benjamin Franklin's papers. And here's this letter in which he actually says, there's nothing certain in life but death and taxes. I had heard of that, but here he is. This is when he is coining that phrase. And that's what gives me a thrill. So when I start in a new project, I think this is great. Now I get to go learn a lot of new stuff. And I'm not gonna subcontract out because I'd lose the experience. Which book has been the most successful in sales? Uh, over the years, uh, the first American, which is my biography of Benjamin Franklin. And I think largely because Benjamin Franklin is a real easy person for many generations to like. He's the most accessible. George Washington seems kind of stiff these days. And Thomas Jefferson and others, they have issues that come up. But Benjamin Franklin uh, was a pretty congenial guy to be to hang around with for the several years that I was working on the book. And he also just really wears well in part because he's got the best sense of humor of, of any of that period. And so you could imagine sitting down and having an ale or a beer or a brew with Benjamin Franklin. In fact, I had the experience in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, there are people who make their livings as they basically pretend that they're Benjamin Franklin for the tourists. And I gave a talk in Philadelphia and my hosts arranged for one of these Benjamin Franklins to come on stage and introduce me. And they didn't tell me this was going to happen. I said, oh, well, this is kind of embarrassing. You know, uh, I'm going to be talking about your life and you're sitting here and not everything I say is going to be complimentary. But we hit it off. And so afterwards, we went out and just had a drink after the event. And he was walking down the street in his full Franklin costume and people were yelling at him out of the cars. Hey, Ben, how you doing? So Franklin is the one that that's the, the one that sells really well. I will add, though, that I also wrote a biography of Tom, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt is another kind of longtime favorite. So those books have had a long tail. They just keep selling and selling and selling. Any of them or any one of them a dud? Um, well, not in my own mind, uh, <laughs> because when I when I finished them, I thought, OK, I mean, I've, I've generally been pleased with the work when I send it off to the publisher. I mean, I work on it until I'm reasonably well pleased. There were there was a book that did less well than my publisher hoped, but not less well than I expected. So uh, my publisher for the last 20 years has been Doubleday, an imprint of Penguin Random House now. And I had signed a contract to write a biography of Andrew Jackson because I had embarked at this point on this long-term project I had now completed of writing American history in the form of biographies. And I had mapped out six biographies that would cover all of American history. Benjamin Franklin was volume one in the series. And then turned out that, so, so it was Benjamin Franklin, Andrew Jackson was going to be number two. I didn't write them in strict order. And then it was Ulysses Grant, then Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Ronald Reagan. So I had signed a contract to write this book on Andrew Jackson. I was beginning to write on Andrew Jackson. And this was in early 2001. And George Bush... The younger George Bush had just been inaugurated president. And my editor and the publisher at Doubleday, they said, oh, we've got this new Texas president. Why don't you write a book on Texas history? And I've at that point, I had lived in Texas for 20 years, and I know that there's a good story in Texas history, so OK. And they imagined that this interest in George W. Bush and in Texas history was going to lead to great appeal around the country. And they were willing to, to pay me a pretty good advance to do it. Now, I had suspicions that they were exaggerating the interest around in the rest of the country in the Texas story. But since they were willing to pay me, I said, OK, I'll write the book. So I wrote the book. I was pleased with the result. And people in Texas 
they responded. They liked it. The book did well in Texas, but it didn't do particularly well outside of Texas. So my publisher considered that one a dud, but <laughs> that was their fault, not mine. At least that's the way I like to think of it. So this book we're talking about today, Founding Partisans, when did you finish it? Ah, so when did I finish it? The, the timetable for publishing books is usually I last touch the book about eight months before it's published. So it was published last November, November 2023. So I made my finishing touches on it in the late winter of 2023. Are you on to the next book? I am, in fact, yeah. So my next book is going to be about the debate over American entry into World War II. And as I have done lately, so for a while I wrote biographies, books that are focused on a single individual. But then I decided to branch out a little bit and focus on more than one individual so I can tell two sides of the story. My book, Founding Partisan, looks at four, Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, Adams. The book that we're talking about now, my next book, is on the debate over American entry into World War II. And the two figures that carry the debate are Franklin Roosevelt, who's in favor of intervention in World War II, and Charles Lindbergh, the leader of the opponents, the so-called isolationists. So that's going to be my next book, and that will come out in the autumn sometime. Let me ask you about the four people <clears throat> that you feature and ask you in order so that we today could kind of understand what they stood for. If Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, Adams were here right now, they just all of a sudden ended up on this uh, back on this earth, I'll start with Hamilton. What would he think about what he would see going on in this country right now? So this is a question I get fairly often, and it's a really hard one to answer. And I'm, I'm not dodging your question. I'll do my best to answer it. But one thing that I will say is that individuals are successful in history. And the four men that I focused on, and you identified, were successful at their time. And two of them were president, and two of them were leading figures otherwise. But especially in a democracy, people are successful because they suit the time, they suit the moment, and moments change. And so there's no guarantee that any of the four, if they landed on earth in the 2020s, if they landed in the United States in the 2020s, would even go into politics at all, or if they went into politics, that they would be good at it. But having said that, I would say Hamilton was the one who was most enthusiastic about a larger, more energetic role for government. And that's the function that he plays in my story. He's one of the authors of the Constitution. He is one of the, the principal organizer of the Federalist Papers, which are all in favor of this stronger federal government. When he becomes George Washington Secretary of the Treasury, he promotes the idea of a national bank, assumption of debts, a manufacturing policy, the whole thing. So he's consistently pushing for energetic, strong government. Where would that land Alexander Hamilton today? Well, it's going to sound odd because Hamilton is usually most cherished these days by conservatives. But Hamilton would probably be a Joe Biden Democrat if we're talking about his confidence in the ability of the federal government to do things well and to do things right. So, well, let, that's let me just throw in this. <clears throat> Let's say he's standing out on Pennsylvania Avenue right now and he right in front of the district court and the circuit court in town, and he's thinking through what's happened here on January the 6th and what happened with the President Trump and how he operated and this whole issue that we have discussed over the last year, whether or not this president has immunity. And I know you point out in your book that Hamilton wanted an executive in perpetuity. Right. Well, what would he think, though, about what has happened when it comes to the specifics of what we see in our lives today and this discussion going on around 2024? If it had been within Hamilton's power, he would have mobilized the army against the insurrectionists of January 6th. He would have shot several of them. He might very well have shot Donald Trump because Hamilton was extremely quick to insist on suppressing any hint of rebellion. It was Alexander Hamilton who caused, who prompted George Washington to go after the Whiskey Rebellion in the early 1790s. He said, we've got to crush this rebellion because Hamilton was a firm believer in government as this institution upholding order. And without order, self-government was gone. 
So Hamilton's fear, and this is one of the reasons he wanted such a strong central government, the fear that this government would devolve into democracy, where ordinary people might get the idea that they actually they ought to exercise political power. And Hamilton thought this was a terrible idea. And this was one of the reasons that he thought that the president ought to govern, ought to be president for life. And his, his model was George Washington ought to do it. And actually, we sort of came within a whisker of that because there's no term limit on presidents in the original constitution. And George Washington, he might, he did serve two terms. He didn't have to retire. If he hadn't retired, and well, he did die before what would have been his third term had run out. And if George Washington had not retired after two terms and had died in office, then that would have set the precedent that presidents get elected and they stay in office until they die. Now, it wouldn't have been necessary, but no more necessary or less necessary than the two-term precedent that Washington had set. So we could have had something like the papacy, where you get elected, and then the expectation is you serve until God calls you, you're taken away. But we didn't. James Madison, as you point out, was a member of Congress uh, and, and also president of the United States. What would his view be? And, you know, just for the heck of it, what if he had been in that chamber on January the 6th? What would he have thought based on what they they thought in the, from the very beginning on how the government was set up? So all four of these men, in fact, everybody else of that generation understood that this American, this American experiment in self-government was an experiment that was not necessarily fated to succeed. They realized they had created the country during war. They had made a first try at a national government under the Articles of Confederation. And Hamilton and Madison had been instrumental in overthrowing that government. And they thought that it was too weak. So they understood that government had to be able to defend itself. And they also understood that it could fall apart at any moment, which meant that they were very concerned that any attempts to overthrow the government, any ideas that the government could be undermined, needed to be crushed right away, because otherwise this thing would just fall apart. Their, again, their great concern is, and, and it's worth, it's really important to remember, they understood that they had created this thing that had never been created before. Other governments, other countries emerged organically out of the mists of the past. But the government of the United States it was, the, was this thing that was created first in 1776 and then again in 1787. And what people can put together, people can pull apart. So Madison, if he had been in Congress on the time, he would, again, he would have gotten the sergeant at arms to call the police and call everybody and bring the, bring the army in to suppress this rebellion. In fact, Ham, excuse me, Madison had dealt with such a thing when he was in the Continental Congress. And, and in fact, it's the end of the Revolutionary War when soldiers from the Continental Army mutinied and marched on the place in Philadelphia where the Continental Congress was meeting. And, and, and Madison and Hamilton and the rest of the Congress, they had to flee before this uprising. And again, one of the reasons that Hamilton and Madison wrote the Constitution they did is to prevent this happening. I should add, that's also why we have a national government that is not located within the boundaries of any state, because the leaders of this uprising to put pressure on Congress were members of the Pennsylvania militia. And this was in Philadelphia. And the governor of Pennsylvania declined to call out the Pennsylvania militia for fear that it would lose him votes at the next election. And so that's when they realized, okay, we have to have a national government that is not beholden to any state government or any state governor. What would, how would you describe Madison's personality? Madison was the most bookish, bookish of the four. He's also the one who is in some ways the most intriguing because he clearly changed his mind in the course of the events that I describe. And for the listeners, uh, I describe the events from the mid 1780s to the election of 1800. And Madison begins as this arch federalist. He's the one who really organizes the rewrite of the Articles of Confederation, except he knows that we're not just going to rewrite the Articles of Confederation, we're going to overthrow them and write a new constitution. And then he's a prime mover behind getting the constitution ratified. He's the one who brings Virginia on board, the biggest, most populous of the states. So he's all in favor of a stronger central government. 
But then once this central government is created, and once Alexander Hamilton, his, his partner in all of this, gets into the Washington cabinet and proposes these grand schemes where there's really much stronger central government, then, then Madison begins to have second thoughts. It's almost as though, man, what have I created here? And so Madison drifts away from being, well, he was a federalist in the debate over the Constitution, but he gravitates away from that Federalist Party as it extends into the 1790s and becomes the Federalist Party as we know it and switches sides and joins with his Virginia neighbor and friend, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson, who also had been a Federalist in the debate over the Constitution, should it be ratified, but from a distance, he was in France at the time. But then he comes back and both Madison and Hamilton, I mean, see, Madison and Jefferson, they began to have their reservations, their concerns about the strength of this central government. And with Madison, there's a it's there that takes a really interesting form because when the Constitution is being debated, there are a lot of skeptics who say, wait a minute, wait a minute, where is our Bill of Rights? Where is the list of things that this new government cannot do? And they were used to a Bill of Rights from as it evolved historically in England. And then the state governments with their constitutions, most of them had bills of rights saying, okay, government can do this, but it cannot do this, 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 and this. Where is this bill of rights to the national government? And Madison, as the principal author of the constitution said, we don't really need it because this is a positive constitution, meaning that only those powers that are explicitly granted to this new government are powers that it has. Otherwise it doesn't have those powers. And the skeptic is, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not the way government works. Governments. People in government, they reach, they grab. And so we want to make sure that you draw the line here. And Madison was finally talked into this. And in the debate, he came to conclude, you know what? Maybe this Bill of Rights is a good idea after all. Now, part of it was he said, OK, if we must have a Bill of Rights, I'm going to write it. And so he did. But he almost he really sort of converted himself to the skepticism of government. And so Madison is this very interesting example because you don't see it in politics, for that matter, in life, I think, all that much, where somebody fundamentally changes his or her mind on uh, an issue of very large importance. Okay. A little bit of a pause on process and how you write and all that. On this book, <clears throat> we'll come back to the others, of course. There's no index, no acknowledgments, and no chapter listings. You have part listings and all that. What's that? Is that normal for you? There is an index. There's in, there is an index. There isn't the not acknowledgments and the chapters my, are. Yeah, my apologies. I don't know why yeah. I okay. didn't. So, see it. yeah, um, but the way I've organized it is you mentioned that there are no chapters per se. So what I do is I've broken the book down into several sections and I think it's six or eight sections and each of those sections has a title. But within those sections, there are simply numbered chapters. And the reason for this is I, years ago, I started writing shorter chapters. And I started writing shorter chapters because I had been reading uh, various things. I read some stuff by, well, it was the time when James Patterson, was the, the novelist, was first becoming popular. So I said, I got to pick up one of these books and you know, see what makes it work. So I pick up one of the books and the first thing that strikes me is they have short chapters. And I began to realize logistically from the standpoint of a reader, short chapters are great because if you're you know, reading before you go to sleep at night and you finish a chapter and you see, oh, well, the next chapter is only six pages, I'll read that. But if the next chapter is 35 pages, you say, forget it, I'm not going to do it. The other thing is that the reader, because you go through chapters quickly, think that you know, this book is just hurtling along. And that's that's the feeling the author wants to give to the reader. The things are flying by. We're really making progress here. So I decided to write shorter chapters. But if I wrote short chapters, and it was turned out I'd have you know 60 chapters if I added them all up, and I couldn't come up with 60 titles for chapters. The other thing is, the other thing is, and, and I will um, admit to this, I try to make my books read like novels in the following sense. There is no reason anybody has to read a novel. A novel justifies itself by the fact that it pulls the reader along. And I hope to write my books in the same way. 
And so I don't want my readers to think, okay, boy, uh, you know, I had a history class in high school or college, and so I'm going to learn some more history. I don't want them to think that this is an assignment. I don't want them to think that this is a project. I don't even particularly want them to think this is a project that's going to make them a better person or anything like that. I just want them to read it and enjoy it. And so I try to sort of take away some of the cues that say, this is a history book, as opposed to this is just any old book. So so that's the chapters are short and the and the sections are numbered. They give you an idea of sort of where we're going. But within that, no, nope, I just number and away they go. And, and the other thing is the acknowledgments. I, I have not read all of your books, so I don't know if you've done it in the past. But most authors have an acknowledgment chapter where they thank everybody, including their dogs. Yeah, I got to tell you that for my first 20 books, I wrote acknowledgments. And and I, I don't say this is wrong thing to do by any means. I mean, it's great. But I found that I was sort of acknowledging the same people all the time. And there's nothing wrong about that either. But when, when I pick up a book as a reader, because I'm thinking read the reader's experience in all this, when I'm a reader, I don't read the acknowledgments. The acknowledgments are just something to get in the way, get out of there. Yeah, you know, I want to get to the, this is why I don't write a preface. This is why I don't write an introduction. This is why, again, I don't write acknowledgments. I really want, I, I'd do without the title page if I could. I just, you know, the book automatically opened to page one and off we go. And so as a writer, I, I basically have this um, social contract with my publisher. And the deal is publisher, editor, all the people publishing, the marketing people, the people who design the dust jacket, it's their job to get the book pulled off the shelf at the bookstore, pulled off the shelf at the library. It's their job to get reader to page one. So there's something about the book is well designed, it's well positioned, and the reader says, okay, I'll pull it off the shelf, get to page one, and it's my job to take it from there. And my job is to get the reader from page one to page the last. So if anything that gets in the way of that, I say, if it's not necessary, let's get rid of it. Right. And when I concluded that, you know, as a reader, I don't read it. And the people who need thanking, I thank privately. And I don't think it serves any greater purpose to ha Have you ever me. abandoned a book in the middle of it? <laughs> as a reader or a writer? No, no, <laughs> as a writer. Okay. Well, the first thing that I will say is I encourage readers to abandon books in the middle. Yeah. Because life is short. And if you're not liking this, don't feel you got to slog through to the end. As a writer, um, yeah, I have. Uh, usually because of a miscommunication between myself and my publisher. So what happens is when I'm writing a book, I finish the book, I send it off to the publisher, and I'm eager to get on to the next book. Now, Contractually, my publisher is not required to entertain proposals by me for my next book until the book has been formally accepted and then another few months have passed. It's just written into the contract and it gives them time to do other stuff and all this. So in the meantime, I'm trying to figure out, so what's my next project going to be? And I often think, okay, I got a great idea, so I'll start writing it. And then, and the way I decide what is going to be my next book, it is actually as a result of what amounts to negotiation with my publisher. And I have to persuade my publisher that this idea I have for my next book is worth publishing and crucially is worth my publisher paying me as an advance what I think I ought to get paid. So it's a good discipline for me. If I can't persuade my publisher, then probably readers won't be persuaded either. But sometimes I've overestimated the the enthusiasm that I'm going to get from my publisher for my next project. So I'll start writing a book and then my publisher won't be enthused about it when I pitch it. And so the book will then have to, what I've written usually gets set aside or sometimes, sometimes I manage to kind of work it into something else. So, and, and the last thing I will say is because I'm a teacher, because I'm a teacher, none of this is lost. If I don't see it between covers on a bookshelf, what I've learned will better inform my teaching for my students. Can you give us an example of what you've written in the past that it didn't work? So I had this idea that I was gonna write a trilogy of the history of the American West. And I have already written 
two legs of the trilogy. My book on Texas that we talked about, and this is sort of the founding of American Texas. And then I wrote a book on the California gold rush. Again, a key moment in the history of the West and the, the formation of modern California. And then because I'm from Oregon, grew up in Oregon, I thought, well, the third leg of the trilogy would be the history of Oregon and the Oregon Trail and all this. So I started writing this book on Oregon and the Oregon Trail. And I just couldn't persuade my publisher that this was a big enough, interesting enough story. And maybe maybe I had myopia being from Oregon. I thought, well, yeah, this is really, really important, really interesting. So I set it aside, but I will say this, that I was able to repurpose some of that stuff. And I then wound up writing um, a broader history of the American West. It came out as Dreams of El Dorado, in which I was able to take some of the stuff that I used, uh, that I had written for Oregon and included in that book. Back to founding partisans. We have two more, that, at least on the cover. There are a lot more people inside the book that are interesting to ask you about. Thomas Jefferson. What would Thomas Jefferson be thinking if he uh, lighted back here at this stage? Thomas Jefferson was an eternal optimist when it came to human nature. So Jefferson would have believed that humans could figure, we could figure our way out of pretty much anything. He was the last person to subscribe to resign himself to doom and gloom. So he never would have admitted that America was, the American Republic was on its last legs or anything like that. Now, having said that, he also was one who believed that he had some very idiosyncratic ideas, but it makes him very, the more interesting because of this. So for example, he was a firm believer in self-government, but sort of literally self-government. He believed that you and I and our generation should govern our generation, but he didn't think that the laws that we wrote should govern our children. Our children's generation should write their own laws. So he thought, I mean, we they, these days we call it usually a, a sunset clause in a law that it, the law lasts only so long and then it expires and has to be renewed. So he thought that would be a good idea. And he actually sort of philosophized over this and, and asked himself, so how long should a law last? And he concluded that maybe 17, 20 years, basically the length of a generation. He also believed that revolutions ought to happen every so often because things get too ossified and institutions get too entrenched and we need to shake them up. And it was sort of easy for him to say in, well, in the immediate aftermath of America's successful revolution, he had a little bit harder time justifying it when the French Revolution went bad. But even then, even then, he found ways to sort of explain away the violence of the French Revolution. Also, Jefferson was one who could, who could embrace a certain political theory, strict construction of the meaning of the Constitution. When he was out of power, when Jefferson was in opposition, he said that the government, the president in particular, cannot exercise any greater power than is explicitly authorized, enumerated in the Constitution. So he's a strict constitution, he has a narrow view of the constitution. Then he becomes president and all of a sudden he's, well, maybe the power is not such a bad idea. And in fact, Jefferson was able to swallow his scruples on a crucial decision in his presidency. In fact, one of the most important decisions in American history. And that is he was able to justify without constitutional authorization, the American purchase of the Louisiana territory, the Louisiana purchase because Napoleon made this offer to sell this vast tract of land in the West to the United States. And Jefferson had always had long been interested in the West. And he thought, this is fantastic. This is the best deal the country could ever make. But then he looked at his copy of the Constitution. He could find no authorization for purchasing territory. It's not in there. Certainly not for the president to do, not for Congress to do. He says, what am I going to do? So he thought briefly, well, maybe we should just add an amendment to the Constitution saying the government and the federal government can acquire new land. But he realized, oh, you know, uh, ratifying the Constitution takes time. And, and Napoleon, he's a kind of mercurial guy. He might change his mind tomorrow and we can't let this deal pass. So he, so I think for the welfare of the country, maybe for the unease of his political conscience, he said, we're just going to go ahead and buy it. And he did it. And so... So it's Jefferson is really hard to pin down. Jefferson is constantly complaining about partisanship, the partisanship of the other side, of the Federalists, of Adams and Hamilton. When in fact, Jefferson is the most successful partisan, one of the most successful partisans in American history. So 
again, I know these this is these are a stretch, but trying to figure all this out. Would t- today would Joe Biden be a federalist and Donald Trump be an anti-federalist? I would say, I think I can say with some confidence that the founder, the framers of the Constitution, they believe that Donald Trump was exactly the person the country needed to be protected against. They were concerned about the emergence of a demagogue, a someone, someone who seemed to have apparently had his own interests only at heart, but could manipulate the political system, could persuade people who had reason to be upset with the status quo and lead them astray. And this was of particular concern to Hamilton and John Adams, who were opposed to the idea of democracy. They thought that political power ought to rest with the well-educated, with the well-off, with the well-connected. Now, Donald Trump, of course, is well-off and well-connected, but they thought that he was exactly the kind of person that the country had to watch out for. So I'm going to leave Trump just sort of out of this equation for a moment, because, I mean, even as recently as 10 years ago, the country had never seen anything like Donald Trump. But to the extent that the framers had thought about this kind of person, they would said, no, we, he's not one of us. And we need to make sure that we don't encounter somebody like that. So, and that actually, I would add, that was one of their concerns about the emergence of parties. I'm, my book tells the story of the emergence of parties, but I need to remind that everybody at first thought parties were a terrible idea. They hoped the United States would be spared political parties because they were concerned that some adventurer, that was a term that they often use, would come along and basically form a faction. Faction was a term they used in preference to party. Uh, form a faction behind him and would come in and take over the place. And they saw it happen in France. That's exactly what Napoleon did. And so there was this French Republic and then Napoleon, the strong man on the horse, came in and took it over. So they, they hoped that that would not happen in the United States. So, you know, where would where would Jefferson, where would Madison have landed today? Well, the first thing I have to say, and I'll, I'm kind of reiterating what I said before, they had great reverence for the whole idea that the 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 ball game is played within the rules, and you don't if you lose the election, you accept that you lose the election, and the appropriate response is to go work hard to try to win the election, not complain that the election was stolen or that it was wrongly counted. No. I mean, even if there were irregularities, just shut up and go campaign harder again. Your job is to persuade. Your job is not to undermine the republic. And again, because they understood, they had a real sense of the fragility of the republic as this institution. And this is something that is hard to recapture because we live now when the republic is approaching its 250th anniversary. So it's tempting to think, my God, it was always here. It will always be here. But these are the people who created it. And they understood that it didn't just happen. It happened because certain people did certain things at critical moments. And so they they saw the fragility. This thing could fall apart at any time. So again, trying to (laughs) connect it to today, would a Jefferson or a Hamilton or a Madison agree that the president is immune from being prosecuted, either in office or once he's left office? I doubt it. It didn't come up, and they could hardly imagine it because their model of a president was George Washington, and they simply could not imagine George Washington doing anything like that. They also believed, or at least wanted to believe, in a a term they use very often is civic virtue. And they thought, and, and they had reason to believe this, that public men, of course, they were all men in those days, public men would be motivated by the public interest. And this was the generation that had won American liberty, American independence, American sovereignty during war. And they had all sacrificed for this. And they had a hard time believing that anyone would be so low or conniving as to try to aggrandize himself at the expense of the nation. Now, this was one of the reasons, there were a bunch of reasons, this is one of the reasons that Jefferson when he's president, and his presidency is beyond my story here, but Jefferson takes it so amiss when Aaron Burr goes off to the West after he's left the vice presidency, he goes off to the West and does some stuff that Jefferson construes to be 
efforts to split the Western part of the United States off from the rest of the country and create a new country of his own, maybe with Aaron Burr as emperor. And so Jefferson brings treason charges against Burr. It's uh, one of the most celebrated trials in American history. Jefferson loses, Burr is acquitted. But this is something that Jefferson was very concerned about. And so I should add, I should add this as well, that we're talking about a period when politics was contained within a small group of people. So they all knew each other. And so they, they knew the character of each other, and they thought that that was necessary. This kind of a, this is one of the reasons we have an electoral college, because ordinary voters in Massachusetts will not know whether a candidate from Virginia is qualified or not. But the electors, they probably would have met this person, whoever it was. So that's part of the reason we have that. And there's here's a fundamental question, and it's a it's a question that anybody interested in American politics. Uh, needs to at least consider every now and then, not that there's an obvious alternative. But they wrote a constitution. They created a government for a nation of 4 million people. And now we're a nation of 340 million people. Can the government that they created expand to accommodate this very much larger group? And the, the deeper question is, can a nation of 340 million people actually be governed? Is that simply too big? There are bigger nations in the world, China, but most people in America don't want a repressive government like China's. India, well, India's democracy is being put to a severe test these recent years, and so nobody knows what's, what's going to come of that. So it's entirely possible that we've kind of, we as a nation in numbers, have outgrown this thing that we had back at the beginning. Now, one of the secrets of success of the Constitution, which is a part of my story, the writing of the Constitution, ratifying the Constitution, is that it is just, it's just a, a rough outline. It's not a detailed blueprint. It's just a rough outline. And so it grows a lot. And, and people who take the position that, you know, we can only do what the, the framers thought, the originalist position, I think they're, I'm not sure that they're always entirely sincere, but to the extent that they are, you know, please, um, you know, the Constitution says that the Congress can raise an army. Can it raise an air force? Well, you know, there were no airplanes. So there's all sorts of stuff that they had no way of knowing about. And to ask their outline to fit that requires, well, it requires a lot of room for growth. And so you can pretend it doesn't happen, but the Constitution does grow and change over time. If it hadn't, it wouldn't still be our Constitution. We would have had to try something else. Last name on the cover, John Adams. How does he figure in all this? And what would you have thought of him if you had a chance to visit? I think I would have had the same opinion of Adams that Benjamin Franklin did. And Franklin once said that, that Adams is the most honest person you could imagine. He is sincere. He is hardworking. But sometimes he is absolutely out of his mind. And so Adams is the... I have to speak now as somebody who chose these characters because these characters allow me to get inside their heads. I had to have access to their writings, their letters, their journals, and so on. And Hamilton's letters, they tend to be theoretical, but there's very little of the soul of Alexander Hamilton there. Madison is the same way. Jefferson, you see his airy flights of philosophy. With Adams, he bears his soul. Now, part of it is because he's writing to his wife. Um, it's an un I mean, the the marriage, the the longtime love affair between John and Abigail Adams is one of the great and heartwarming stories of American history. But there is an interesting irony here, here that the best part of that relationship for historians is the worst part of that relationship for John and Abigail, namely the years when they were apart. Because when they were together, they just spoke. When they were apart, that's when they wrote. And so John would write and bear his soul to Abigail and talk about his frustrations with George Washington and is George Washington ever going to retire? And is anybody going to appreciate the good work that I have done to create this republic? And John Adams writes a letter to Benjamin Rush, uh, Philadelphia, position, you knew. And Adams complains 
Adams is constantly concerned that history will not give him sufficient credit for what he had done. And Adams tells Rush, when the history of our revolution is written, it's going to be a pack of lies from beginning to end. And it's going to go like this, that Dr. Franklin struck the earth with his lightning rod and out jumped General Washington. And between the two of them, Washington and Franklin, they conducted all the affairs, all the affairs of war and peace. And unsaid was that, and my name's not going to be in there at all. And that's really going to be unfair. So he is in some ways the most human. He, at least he comes across as the most human of these four. And I think it's one of the reasons that the authors and biographers just love John Adams. Because you've been in the classroom for years and you've been out and about speaking with all of your books, I wonder what you <clears throat> think, the, and I'm, I'm just looking at the name Hamilton and wonder what you think the impact of the musical had on people's interest in history. And then secondly, that his his own politics and the, the left of center people took advantage of Hamilton, had fundraisers off of him. Obama had fundraisers off of him. And, and you know, you're, you get jumbled on what they really stood for and put that in perspective and uh, whether or not, why did it turn into such a political football? Well, I will say this, that any time you can get history mentioned outside the history books, whether it's on stage on Broadway, whether it's in a movie, when it's in a TV series, whatever it is, that generally speaking is a boon to those of us who teach and write history because it, it brings historical events and people before an audience that you would naturally get. So that's a good thing. And then there are people who say, what? Well, boy, that Hamilton and the musical was really good. I'm gonna learn more about it. Now, there's a downside to this that when historical stories are dramatized, when they're made into films, when they're written into historical novels, um, the demands of a film, the dramatic demands of a novel, the musical demands, you know, the song and dance and all this, they require often some modifications to chronology, to sometimes characters are melded together. And so there are times when I, as the historian, have to say, well, okay, in, in spirit, it was, it caught the, the character of Alexander Hamilton, but don't, don't take it as an authority on details or that kind of thing. And sometimes, sometimes this will go to extremes where Oliver Stone makes a movie about essentially LBJ assassinating JFK. And I have to explain, no, it didn't happen that way, but anyway, but having said that, okay, it generates interest in history. And, and by and large, that's a good thing because to me, to me, if there's a single reminder, I'm not even going to call it a lesson, but if there's a single reminder that history should afford to people, it is that our generation is not the first generation to walk the face of the earth. We humans today are about the 10,000th generation of humans. It's very tempting for every generation. And I see this temptation at its peak in the 18 and 19 year old young men and women who come into my classroom. Because when you're that age, you think that the world was either created for you or you're going to create the world anew. And it's a reminder that there have been smart people, honest, sincere people who lived before you. And they dealt with many of the same issues that you are going to deal with. And so you don't have to accept everything that they say. You certainly don't accept it on authority, but accept it as the evidence that, that other people have been here too. And so be modest in your demands of the present. Be charitable in your interpretation of the past. They were doing the best they could, just like you're going to do the best you can. And bear in mind, and this is, I always do this in the, on the last day of class with my students. And I've had them from September to May. And I now am <clears throat> about 50 years older than my students. There was a time when I was only five years older than my students. Time passes. And I say, if you don't like the world that you are being given, the world you are inheriting right now, blame me, blame people my age, because my generation and the generations that came before me, we created the world we are handing off to you. And then I say, you might not believe this now, but one day, most of you are gonna be my age. And if you don't like the world then, 
blame yourselves because we're handing it off to you. It's yours now. So do with it what you can. The Adams book by McCullough and then the HBO series. Did you notice any interest more more interest in Adams at the time when that when that either the book or the series came out? Yes. And I'll say this because until that point, Adams really had had kind of suffered what Adams himself thought he was going to suffer. He was not to use a movie analogy, he wasn't the star of the movie. He was the movie's best friend, movie star's best friend uh, until then. But David McCulloch and then the series after that came along and made him a star in his own right. And so, and, and David McCulloch was very good at doing this, who was, I mean, first of all, very good at humanizing these figures and portraying them as full people. And he was also very good at, and. David McCulloch was probably better at this than just about anybody I know, and I certainly include myself in this. Um, David McCulloch always used to say that he brought out every skeleton in John Adams's closet. And by the way, he said the same thing about Harry Truman. And, and I consider those two books to be Paris. He wrote biographies of both of them, and both of them were sort of second tier leaders before McCulloch got to them. But then he made them out to be these underdogs who you know, triumph through the hard work and all this stuff. And and McCulloch would say perfectly accurately that if you want to know every bad thing that was said about John Adams and Harry Truman as well, it's in my book. Um, yet, as anybody, as any writer knows, you can have the, the principal clause and then the subordinate clause. And so you can say that, you know, John Adams was a cranky individual at times, but he was a true patriot at heart. And so you get the effect of, okay, you get both sides with John Adams, but David McCulloch was always successful in bringing out the better side. So you start out with the question on the, the, the musical, Hamilton. Well, when you read David McCulloch's books, and this is all to the credit of David McCulloch, when you put down his John Adams book, when you put down the Harry Truman book, you think, boy, that Harry Truman, that John Adams was a great guy. And it's like when people are producing musicals, there's a, a rule of thumb that if the audience comes out of the theater whistling the theme song, then you know you've got a hit. And there wasn't music to the John Adams book, but if there had been, people would have put down the Dave McCulloch book sort of whistling the John Adams tune. I want to go a few minutes we have left <clears throat> to a quote, and, and I want to bring up the whole issue of slavery. I've I've been somewhat perplexed over the last 45 years that I've been doing these interviews as how often a historian will want to protect uh, a founder when it comes to slavery. And you may not even agree with that, but <clears throat> I, I mentioned that so you'll comment on it. But first, I want to read this quote from Patrick Henry in your book. Uh, it seemed to reflect uh, <laughs> what uh, you would say about a lot of people back then um, when it comes to slavery. You quote him as saying, as much as I deplore slavery, I see that prudence forbids its absolution. Let me just add, let me just stop there. Why does prudence uh, forbid its absolution, <clears throat> ab abolition back then? Um, and you get that all the time in uh, quotes from founders. And you get it all the way up to Abraham Lincoln. And the issue is this. We've created this republic in which political power rests on the people. Now, as long as most black people in America are slaves, they're not part of the political body. So we don't have to include them in our politics. If we free the slaves, then we're going to have to give them the vote. We're going to have to bring them into our political system or give up the idea of a republic. And there was no example certainly at that point in history, and it's arguable whether there has been an example even until today, of a successful biracial republic. In fact, in those days, there wasn't even an example of a successful republic. And so they thought, okay, basically the question was, if we brought these people over, these African slaves over, to work in our fields, 
If we say that they don't have to work in our fields, what do we do with them then? Can we send them back to Africa? Because they couldn't imagine that they could leave them in Virginia or wherever it might be, Henry was in Virginia, and integrate them into the political system. And this was a principal concern as late as the 1850s, 1860s with Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, he brought into the White House a group of black ministers, African-American ministers, and he encouraged them. This was after the, he had issued the Emancipation Proclamation. He encouraged them to take their flocks and leave the United States and go to Liberia or go to Central America or something else because he, he couldn't figure out how they could square this problem of a republic and then make it a biracial republic as well. And I think it's fair to say we've been struggling with that ever since. So that was, that was the thinking of somebody like Henry. The other thing is we the people, uh, all men are created equal. I think they really meant it. All, all white men were created equal. But if you go down the list, I mean, I've, in getting ready for this interview, I even found a note that it wasn't until 1826 that Jews could vote in Maryland. And if you go down the list, and I know you know this stuff from uh, inside out, of when people were allowed to vote, what was said in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution doesn't seem to track very well with the first hundred years of voters' rights in the country for women, blacks, and, and others, and Asians, as you know, the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act and all that. Help, help us out here. Well, let me put the question to you in a form that I put to my students. So my students are typically 18, 19, 20 years old. And I ask them, how many of them think that 16-year-olds ought to be able to vote in elections? And most of them were just very recently 16 years old. And I'm surprised that almost none of them say 16-year-olds should be able to vote. Now, does that mean that they think they are fundamentally different than they were two years earlier? If they said, am I equal to my younger brother? They would say, yeah, but that doesn't mean that the younger brother has all of the privileges and rights that I have. So I think we've lived, we live in a, an age now when if you say that somebody's equal, we think that that sort of applies to everything. But when people talked about all men are created equal, did Jefferson have in mind women? I don't know. I mean, the term men was often, often used for men and women, but almost nobody thought women ought to or wanted to participate in politics. So we have extended, it's not that there's this changing notion of humanity, that these people aren't humans or something, it's that we have different ideas today of what equality consists of. What was Jefferson thinking? I'm not sure what he was thinking of. There was, in fact, he kind of modeled that on his friend George Mason's version in the, the Virginia Constitution, where it says all men are born equally free. Okay, that's a different thing, because there you're clearly talking about politics and law. Because if you just say all men are created equal, they're not equally tall, they're not equally smart, they're not equally sincere and virtuous and all this other stuff. So on the face of it, it's nonsense. But he was writing it for this particular context, and what he was saying is that Americans are equal politically to British, to the British. And we have just as much as right to our government as they do. And that's the argument he was making. Did Jefferson know that he would be quoted for centuries into the future? I doubt it. If he had known that, would he have written it a little bit differently? Another way of reading this, though, is that Jefferson may have put this out there as a goal to aspire to. So, OK, all men are created equal. Now, we can't actually act on that at every moment, but maybe someday we will. And in fact, if you, I mean, I have contended at times that no more powerful words have ever been written by any human than those five words, all men are created equal. The United States, Americans, we have felt obliged to live up to this. We've done it imperfectly, but I think we've gotten closer and closer. We're certainly not there yet. And that part of the Declaration of Independence has been borrowed and plagiarized and cribbed by nations all around the world in their own declarations of independence. So even if it wasn't literally true, it was this truth to aim for, to aspire to. And I'm a firm believer that ideas matter and words are the form that ideas take. And for Jefferson to say, all men are created, to put it as 
starkly as that, basically gave humanity this target to aim for. And maybe it's one of those targets you never quite reach, but just the effort to get closer is a worthy endeavor in its own. Let's uh, close it out after a couple more questions for you on process. How many hours a day do you write? It varies entirely on what else the demands are on a given day. And because, as I mentioned earlier, I like to write, I don't set aside a block of time to write. I also, I sometimes say half seriously, but half jokingly, that I benefit from having a short attention span. So if I have 10 minutes, I can get something done. I have friends who, unless they can block out a whole morning, it takes them you know, an hour to get kind of up to speed. One advantage of writing every day and writing short snippets is that I can remember where I was when I lifted my fingers from the keyboard. And so I could just go to there and take, take off from there. So I, I, I probably average maybe four hours of writing a day, but I very wi- it varies wildly above and below that. What do you write on? I began by writing longhand on yellow paper, and then I advanced to a manual typewriter, and then to an electric typewriter and a selectric typewriter that was self, that you could correct, you could go back over and correct. And then I got an early version of a personal computer in the 1980s, and I have been writing on a personal computer, but lately I have begun, actually I've kind of circled back there are a lot of people, uh, authors, who dictated in the old days, and they would have a stenographer. So that's what I do. I take my phone, and my phone can transcribe what I say. So very often for her first drafts, I'll just dictate. And this takes me back in my own life because my father ran his own business for years and years. And when I was a kid, I would hang out in the office and do menial kind of stuff around. And I always remember when my father would uh, call his secretary and say, Ruth, uh, please take some dictation. And so he would you know, dictate. And when you have to, when you write orally like this, I, it really causes me, you have, to, you have to know where the sentence is going to end before you start speaking. When you simply do it with your fingers on the keyboard, you can just write the first three words and then figure out where to go from there. But if you're going to, when you are dictating, at least the way I do it, I figure out, okay, so where is this going? And then I'll finish the sentence and then, okay, what's the next sentence going to be? And so on. So it's in some ways, and, and I should add that this was the way I wrote, I think everybody wrote, when it was painful to revise. When you typed the manuscript and you know if you want to change something, you probably have to retype the whole thing. So you were really careful about the first draft. When you can write on a computer, you can be lazy because if this paragraph doesn't fit here, you just move it somewhere else. So in some ways, this takes me back to the first days that I was writing, except that I'm speaking rather than using a pen on stationery. Do you know any other author who writes a book a week, a book a week, book a year like you do? Yeah, Benjamin Franklin. I mean, sorry, not Benjamin Franklin, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt was remarkable. (laughs) Theodore Roosevelt wrote something like 50 books in his life, and he died at the age of 60. And he had a full-time day job all the while. So... Any, you know, any author who is said to be prolific, measure them against Theodore Roosevelt, they, they pale by comparison. Our guest has been H.W. Brands, Bill Brands, professor at the University of Texas. The name of the, this particular book is called Founding Partisans. It's about Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, and Adams, and we thank you so much for your time. Great to talk to you, Brian. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments? We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. 